celebrate this light of life and we rise to worship together and sing. place with these words, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. you. Congregation may be seated. All praise to you, we've just sung. And we recognize the incongruity between our words that we sing on Sunday mornings and the way we live our lives Monday through Saturday. Uh, Indeed, we do not live our lives in such a way that we are constantly offering all praise to God. So often, uh, we turn insular and inward and We are focused on ourselves. We do not love God, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we do not love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. And so we find this instinctive need every time we come into God's house to be honest, to come clean before God and before one another about who we are. And we do so using the prayer of confession that's printed in our bulletins. The words will also be on the screen. I'd invite you to pray with your eyes open as together we say the words that are in the bold font. Together, let's confess our sin. God who shines forth, long ago the prophet Isaiah called us into your presence so that we can receive and reflect your goodness and glory in the world. But too often we reject this ancient call. 
Forgive us for not recognizing and receiving Your light. Forgive us for not reflecting Your glory to those around us. Forgive us for not lifting up our heads to see Your presence. In forgiveness, may we respond to your call in the example of Jesus, the true light of the world, in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning we sing of our assurance of forgiveness through the words of the Epiphany Carol. Uh, That hymn is found in your bulletins. The congregation is invited to stand as we sing. Now we see our true salvation in the glory of your Son. Friends, in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven people. Go forth to live in that peace. And we prepare our hearts to hear God's word by standing, uh, remaining standing to sing together verse, or verse number three of hymn number 126. So come, let us adore him. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing this song as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word.
Let the restlessness of our bodies still, O oh God. Let the scrolling of our thoughts pause. Let the worries of our hearts ease, that we may hear this word, your word, and enter into the glory of your transforming presence through our lives. It's in your name that we pray all together as God's people, we say, amen. You may be seated. Epiphany, um, epiphany, it, it means revelation, manifestation, appearance. In the Christian church, Epiphany Day and season is marked as a time to remember the various ways in which God's purposes and work in the world are revealed to us. So on this Epiphany Sunday, we hear how God has been drawing people into those purposes since so long ago, even way back, revealing, manifesting, appearing in the words of a long ago prophet named Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you. His glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and rulers the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes. And look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on the hips of their nurses' arms. And then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How not... To Have to Wash the Dishes by Shel Silverstein. If you have to dry the dishes, such an awful, boring chore. If you have to dry the dishes instead of going to the store. If you have to dry the dishes and you drop one on the floor, maybe they won't let you dry the dishes anymore. In 1981, Shell Silverstein introduced an entire generation of children to a whimsical world in which dishes didn't have to get dried, and homework was completed by a homework machine, and favorite toys they never had be shared in the hilariously lyrical pages of A Light in the Attic. Do you remember this book? Now, as someone who found herself washing and drying dishes every single night as one of my chores, how not to dry the dishes, it spoke for me. It gave voice to my seven-year-old experience. If you have to dry the dishes, such an awful, boring chore, it spoke for me. And it spoke to me imagining a new reality of absolutely not having to do the dishes anymore. If you have to dry the dishes and you drop one on the floor, maybe you won't have to dry the dishes anymore. As a side note, uh, to any kids here, that doesn't actually work. Trust me. Screwing up your chores only leads to endless teaching moments and more chores. But something about that poem stuck. Poet Judith Hogan puts it into these words as she writes, a poem, whether silly or serious, that echoes long after being heard or read is one that gives voice to our common human struggle while also offering hope for something more thereby sparking a little epiphany, she says. Indeed, 
silly as they may be, the words of Shel Silverstein, the poet, they hit their mark, giving voice to the very real struggle of my seven-year-old experience while offering hope for a dishwashing, dish-drying free world. It was a little epiphany, although I wouldn't have called it such at the time. It was a little aha moment as his words, echoing in my head, somehow made doing the dishes feel a bit more possible as I imagined a day when I would someday definitely own a dishwasher. Now, as silly as they may be, his words they echoed. And serious as they may be, the words of Isaiah, poet and prophet, hit their mark too giving voice to the very real struggle of God's long-ago people, and even us today, while offering hope for something more. It's worth noting that the vast majority of the book of Isaiah, all the prophets really, is poetry. Biblical scholar Dr. Victor Ludlow explains in his book Isaiah, Prophet, Seer, and Poet, writing... Ancient oral cultures did not have written copies of their prophets' words, and they certainly didn't have Google for a quick search. Rather, they had to carry Isaiah's words around up here, meaning they had to listen repeatedly and well and remember. That's why much of the ancient scripture is in poetic form. Poetry repeated sticks in the human brain in our memory. And the prophet poet, Isaiah, crafter of poetic words, put together what we find in Isaiah 60 because the prophet, the poet, wanted those words to stick or, as Hogan put it, to echo long after being heard in the memories of that first generation of listeners. For those first listeners of his poetic prophecy were in the midst of a very real struggle. You see, God's people who had been invaded, conquered, and forced from their homes in the beloved land of Jerusalem and Judah had been living in exile for 70-ish years or so. And while in exile, a new generation was born. Families grew, new homes and communities established in foreign lands, but also stories Stories of the bright and shining homeland of Judah, of the glorious city of Jerusalem, and its sacred temple there were told and retold and told again by parents and grandparents who held on to the hope that their new generation, growing up in a foreign land, would someday return and call Judah home on their behalf. That someday, it finally came. Some, but not all, of God's people, off in foreign exile, packed up their homes and their families to journey to a land they only knew in their vivid imaginations, cobbled together from their parents' and grandparents' stories of the good old days back there. So they arrived, entering into the land of the stories that they'd heard. And the current reality of that promised land and the sacred city was nothing like the one of their imaginations. In short, everything was a mess. Land devastated and uncared for, a city crumbling and decayed, temple completely destroyed. Nothing was like it had been before. And so every day, the people drug themselves out of bed and put one foot in front of the other, but never really woke up fully as they went through the motions of the same seemingly never-ending tasks. Land needing to be recultivated, rubble needing cleared, city infrastructure needing reimagined, homes and buildings needing rebuilt, the temple needing reconstructed, and, and, and still, even with all this needing to be done, 
it wasn't even officially their land, as they remain under the rule and reign of the Persian Empire. The people were weary. The, the struggle of their current reality, it seemed endless, and the work seemed purposeless. One commentator describes their struggle this way, writing, the people were downcast, discouraged, disillusioned, the daily reality of life in the land so much different from the one in their imaginations, the one that had been shaped purely by the beloved stories of the past. And that imagination that had been able to form such vivid, hope-filled images from someone else's stories, that imagination was now fog, shadows, darkness. They were stagnant, unmotivated, uninspired, half asleep, and unable to see past or through or beyond their daily circumstances. Honestly, honestly, it sounds a lot like these stagnant, unmotivated, uninspired, half asleep ancient people of God were what we now call languishing. Languishing. Have you, have you heard this word over the past year or so? If you Google it, you will find it pop up in countless, countless articles from the past year. As psychologists and other mental health professionals have called this the dominant state of being of 2021. The dominant state of being. Languishing. Brought to the field of mental health and well-being in 2002 by Dr. Corey Keyes, here are some of the symptoms and the signs as this word, this state of being, has become prevalent and much more talked about now in our recent time. See if some of them sound familiar. Moods that are not too high or too low. You're not happy, but you wouldn't say you're sad either. Feeling unmotivated more often than usual. Feeling unsettled, but not highly anxious. Difficulty focusing on certain tasks, especially some days more than others. A foggy, sleepy, half-awake brain. Feeling detached from life tasks or people, but not experiencing negative emotions toward them, just disconnected. Apathy toward life and difficulty getting excited about anything. Fatigue, weariness with daily activities, loss of interest in passions and hobbies, feelings of stagnation and being stuck, feeling disconnected from your purpose in life. In her article, Are You Languishing? Here's how to regain your sense of purpose. Ali Cooks Campbell writes, Languishing is a general but pervasive sense of blahness. You don't feel positive or happy, but you also don't fit the diagnostic criteria for depression. While nothing is exactly wrong, nothing's exactly right either. Your general response to ideas or plans is meh. And while you know you could do more, you don't really have the motivation to do more because languishers tend to feel purposeless. You scroll social media. You stare at the television. You reread the same thing over and over. You stay up late playing words with friends or just find your thoughts wandering throughout the day. It's akin to waking up every day to drag yourself out of bed and put one foot in front of the other, but never really waking up fully as you go through the motions of the same seemingly never-ending tasks, food needing to be eaten, work task needing to be done, email needing to be responded to, dishes and clothes needing to be washed, friend needing to be called, and, and more. And it all gets done, but in a stagnant uninspired, half-asleep sort of way, with an underlining sense of purposelessness, unable to see past or through or beyond our daily experiences. 
Does this sound at all familiar for you? Or a friend, or a family member, or a coworker that you know? It does to me. I've felt it myself. I've seen it in others. I've heard our individual and collective languishing in countless conversations over the past year or two, affecting every area of life, from work productivity to once-beloved hobbies to cherished but neglected friendships and family relationships, even, even to church connection and involvement and investment here in this place and our own spiritual growth and discipleship. Pastor Julie Nyheis writes, Christian faith does not make us or our congregations immune to languishing. Pastoral colleagues across denominations describe the signs of languishing in their communities of faith. Worship attendance is down. Gathering volunteers is more difficult. Participation in other communal events is decreasing. We find ourselves with the ability to be the most connected we've ever been through email, text, social media, virtual gatherings, and more. And we know there is a way to safely gather in person. Yet, something in this unique moment makes the communal disconnect so difficult to overcome. She concludes, it's almost like we've forgotten our identity, lost sight of our purpose together as the people of God. Are we living in a unique moment? Yes. But this, this is not a unique problem. The circumstances may be different, but we share a common emotional human experience with our spiritual ancestors of faith. In fact, at the risk of putting words into the prophet's mouth, I think he may have said the very same words about the people of God in his midst in that day, about our spiritual ancestors, saying it's almost like we've forgotten our identity, lost sight, our vision dull and foggy and dark to the purpose together as the people of God. And so, into individual and collective languaging, into struggling purposeless people of long ago and really today, the prophet speaks. It's a poem. It's mingling struggle with hope. It's speaking into a people dulled and half asleep with their purposelessness to part the fog and drive out the shadows and illumine the darkness, revealing once again the purposes of God to them, the light shining in the darkness. It's an echo, really. An echo of a little epiphany that reawakens God's people to the purposes and plans of God's imagination. And if poetry isn't your jam, after watching a few bowl games recently in our house, I might even liken Isaiah to a coach at halftime in the locker room trying to rally a team that has spent the first half going through the motions but with no passion, still time to get back in the game when halftime is over. And so whether a coach at halftime rallying a people or a poet proclaiming with hope a new reality, Isaiah says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness, you people, but the Lord will rise upon you. His glory will appear over you. Nations, they shall come to your light, and kings, the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes. Look around. They all gather together to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on the hips of their nurses' arms, and then, then you shall see and be radiant. Your hearts shall thrill and rejoice. I like the way that Eugene Peterson paraphrased this in his The Message. Get up, O people of God. Get out of bed. Wake up. Put your face into the light, for God's bright glory has risen for you. The whole earth may seem wrapped in darkness, and all people sunk in deep darkness, but truly God rises on you. Divine sunrise glory breaks upon you. 
to a people weary, disheartened, disconnected. These words offer a change in perspective. Biblical scholar Christopher Hayes writes in his commentary, Isaiah's poetic words are first and foremost a call, a rallying cry to a circumstance-weary people of God to perceive and participate in the glorious purposes of God. A rallying cry to a people of God whose vision is doled by the fog of circumstance to perceive, to see it, and to participate in the glorious purposes of God. When we are weary, we tend to internalize and isolate, meaning perception becomes focused down and within on our own individual issues, struggles, to-dos. For the most part, this means like I get stuck focusing on looking upon my own circumstance, current conditions, and you are looking at yours, and we are not looking past or through or beyond right now, this wearying moment. So Isaiah's words, these poetic words, this rallying cry halftime, call people, call us, Not as individuals only, but a collective, communal people of God together to shake off the fog of circumstance, the darkness dulling our purpose, to look up and out and around, paying attention once again to the work God is already doing, never stopped doing, will continue to do, and has yet to do. And it's a call to wake up to get into action, to reflecting the work of God's purposes in the world. To see, to reflect, and to do. To tell about this light, this glory, with our lives and our actions. I think the words of another beloved poet, I dare say also a prophet, Mary Oliver, in a portion of her poem, Sometimes, her words, they brilliantly and unintentionally capture Isaiah's point. She writes, Instructions for living life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. In word and in deed, as Jesus models for us. This poem, this ancient bit of poetry to a long ago people is a call to once again perceive and participate in the glorious purposes of God. And it's our call to Our call in the midst of a season in time and history where the overall state of being seems to be languishing. Interestingly enough, the past two years have seen a rise in something else besides our individual and collective languishing. Popularity of poetry is on the rise too. A 25% increase over the past year in internet searches for poetry and poets. Poets.org alone had one million more views in the first few months of 2021 than the previous year. Poetry books, poetry podcasts, poetry-focused social media accounts all experienced increases in sale and engagement in 2021, just as we have experienced an increased human struggle with our overall sense of well-being, an increased need for some kind of hope in the midst of our own individual and collective languishing, it seems our interest in poetry has increased as well. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that there's a cause and effect relationship here, but it is curious, isn't it, that we might just be searching for words, that 
echo long after being heard or read, giving voice to our common human struggle while also offering hope for something more, sparking a little epiphany. We might just be searching for the very words that the prophet poet Isaiah offers us. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And all God's people said together, Amen. Please pray with me. God, the light, your light, does not dim when Christmas trees get taken down and strings of lights get packed away in boxes. Your light shines from us. And no dullness, no fog, no darkness can overcome it. May we be those who go forth from this place, ready to name our weariness, if it plagues us, but also ready to perceive and to participate anew in your purposes as the people of God. And together, all God's people said, Amen. The invitation to perceive and participate in God's glorious purposes comes to us also at the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, God with us. This table here is the ultimate invitation to join in those purposes together. We'll participate in communion this morning using the packets that were distributed by the elders as you walked in to worship this morning. Uh, the bread is on one side, uh, the juice on the other. These are gluten-free elements. If you did not receive one of these little packages, would you please raise your hand so the elders uh, could distribute those to those who did not receive them? Um, that would be wonderful. Once again, the bread will be distributed, uh, or the bread, once the bread is, um, Pastor Elizabeth invites us to eat, we'll eat together the bread, so wait until you're instructed to do so, and we'll do the same thing with the juice. So wait until you're instructed, and then as a congregation, we will do so together. Following the service, we also invite you to take your wrapper and your cup um, with you to the garbage and dispose of that after worship so there's not extra work for people here to pick up those things. And children are welcome to participate in the sacrament of communion at the discretion of their parents or guardians. Uh, they are welcome. As always, we invite you to participate in this prayer that we pray together, we sing together with our eyes open. You are invited to participate in the bold font. God with us, you created all that is seen and unseen. You even created a covenant with us, calling us to be your light among the nations. When we fail you, you do not fail us, but call us back time and time again. We praise you when the time was right, you revealed yourself to us in Jesus, the light of the world. Therefore, we praise joining our voices with all creation to proclaim your glory. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mild, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. As an expression of your covenant, Jesus offers grace to all. Remembering this grace, we receive this bread and this cup as signs and symbols of your redemptive work in the world. And in thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. By your Spirit, make us one, so that we may be light in darkness, united by your love in every place. 
As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. As this cup pours out the life bread of Christ, may we pour our lives into a world in need. Teach, Teach us, us to befriend the lost, to serve the poor, to reconcile our enemies, and to love our neighbors. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, we give you glory, merciful and mighty God, now and forever. And so we pray. Come, Emmanuel, come. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This bread joins us, is our communion with the body of Christ. And in the same manner, when they had eaten, he took the cup and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Before we continue our response to God's gift of the word, both proclaimed and celebrated in sacrament, just one prayer update. Uh, first of all, thank you for your prayers for Doc Van Leeuwen. Uh, Doc and Bonnie met with uh, their doctor this past week, Wednesday. And the good news is, is that after doing a PET scan, uh, the cancer has not spread to anywhere else. They were a little bit concerned about whether it might be in his bones, but that is not the case. And so uh, Doc will be meeting with doctors at the Junie Island Cancer Center on Wednesday this week in Sioux City uh, to begin talking about a treatment plan. They're already talking about two different kinds uh, of chemotherapy to use, which have been quite effective in this particular cancer. And so we're very hopeful, and we invite your prayers uh, for Doc and Bonnie and the entire Van Leeuwen family as, as they continue, continue to look for you. <clears throat> Let's pray together. God of light and life, we've gathered here in worship and around your table to join our hearts and minds with your purposes in this world. So we pray for your world, for all people around the globe, remembering that in Jesus, you claimed once again to be God of all people everywhere, always. You are God of all oppressed people. We pray for people who suffer under the rule of unjust regimes and governments whose leaders seem to care little about their own people and their needs. Bring compassion, wisdom, and trust to these places. You are God of all bewildered people. We pray for people who know the horror of oppression, imprisonment, and the loss of freedom to act or worship you as they choose. Bring voices of strength and holy discontent to those who work towards freedom and peace. You are God of all defenseless people. We pray for people who struggle with poverty, hunger, diseases, for those who can be cured with modern medicine but lack resources, and for all children who are deprived of the basic necessities of life. We pray for all aid agencies who serve suffering humanity in challenging circumstances, bring resources, access, and skilled people to these places and people in need. You are God of all vulnerable people. We pray for people who cannot speak for themselves, advocate for their needs, and stand for their own dignity and humanity. Bring peace with justice, and raise up justice seekers who willingly speak and act on behalf of those unable to do so. O oh God, plant your hope for all of these things within our hearts and inspire us to pay attention to your purposes, to be astonished by them, and to tell about your purposes through our own work as we get into action in answer to these prayers following in the footsteps of the one who taught us to pray these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 
Last week, we got to hear um, encouraging invitation to discipleship. This week, we continue that by hearing another personal experience and story from Kathy Fictory. We invite her forward along with Jeff Tolspa as they invite us to participate in adult discipleship opportunities which start next Sunday after worship. As Elizabeth said, my name is Kathy Fictory. Um, Carl and Ben and I have been attending uh, ARC now for about a year, um, the last eight months in person. Um, when we came for the first time, we only knew about five families who were part of this church. And even though we all tend to be socially, social introverts, uh, we know how important it is to be plugged into a church family. And that is what led us to join the Sunday school class led by Gail Marinkovic called Managing Our Emotions. Each week, we would read a psalm that expressed a certain emotion, and we would discuss times in our own lives when we felt that emotion. The level of sharing was surprising to me, and it created a unique bond between the participants of this class. As a result of this class, we know several more families and have a deeper connection to our new church home. So that was wonderful. Gail did a fantastic job of leading it, and I can definitely recommend joining an adult Sunday school class in the winter and spring term. I'm looking forward to meeting even more of you through this opportunity, so I hope many of you will sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So I've been asked uh, to say two things. Um, one, a thank you to Harold and to Kathy uh, for their willingness to share their testimonial and experience participating in adult Sunday school. And the second thing that I'm supposed to do is encourage each of you to participate. So my work here is done. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I will tell you a bit of a story. It'll be short. So for near 30 years now, Sarah and I have hosted a book group at our house. Um, we read a book, the group of people that are in the group, and then we get together to discuss that book every month. There are two rules in that book group. One is you have to show up. The second one I'm not going to tell you to protect the guilty. <laughs> the reason for the first one it really is to build community. And I'm going to kind of go off of your sermon. If you're languishing and if you're looking for community and connection, I'm telling you the adult Sunday school uh, classes is a great way for that. You heard Harold reference it. You heard Kathy reference it. It really is an opportunity. Now, I'm married to an academic. She's a doctor. I am only a master. <laughs> so I guarantee you, some of you may be anxious. Well, there's all these smart people, and I don't have anything to add. I'm telling you, it's not about that. It really is an opportunity to get to know each other and to share and just experience that community. And I think that's more important now than in ever. So again, I encourage you, there's some great classes. I know Kevin's hosting a great class on Job. The other one is me, I would tell you that. Um, <laughs> but after that, I know that uh, Kevin McMahon and Jerry are hosting a class and Sarah, which I know is gonna be awesome. So anyway, I encourage you to attend. So thank you. You never want to give a drummer a microphone. 
We continue our response to God by rising together and singing the song that we started off worship with. Impromptu. I mean, you all did, that song was beautifully sung. You did such a wonderful job. First time singing something can be rough, but you really did a great job. So I had to say that quick. But um, really what I was supposed to say are these few announcements. If you saw the intro slides or um, announcement slides, you'll see that um, we're starting a new group for 20-somethings, um, however that gets defined in your life. We're leaving that up to you to self-define. I mean, I probably can't self-define myself as a 20-something, but, you know, whatever. Um, for anyone, you know, singles, marrieds, families with ki or kids, whatever, wherever you're at in life um, in that stage, we're... Um, encouraging you to reach out to Emily Lackman, who's uh, sort of the communications facilitator for that group. Uh, the announcement slide said Tuesday, but I think they're meeting Monday at 7.30 at the Lackman's house. So um, feel free to contact Emily. Would you raise your hand, Emily, so people know? There she is, right there, everyone. Right 
there. Um, contact her if you're interested for more information on that. Also, we want to remind you that Sunday School resumes today. Adult classes next week. Discipleship for adults next week starts. Um, but Sunday School for kids and um, youth starts today. And the reason why adult classes start next week is because we want to encourage you and invite you after you've had a little bit of coffee and cookie and chat time to enter into the sanctuary and help take down and put away um, all of our Advent, Christmas, Epiphany uh, decorations. So we'd love to have lots of hands, lots of hands make light work for that. So we're now in 2022, and we are, uh, of course, grateful for all of your gifts to American Reformed Church, especially to the General Fund uh, last year. Uh, because of the Paycheck Protection Grant we received from the federal government, uh, we have a bit of a surplus from last year. We're grateful for that. We're grateful that we're able to, uh, to save that and to kind of keep that as we move into an uncertain future. Uh, but as we think about our budget for this coming year, we know the federal government isn't going to give us another check. And because of that, that means that all of us need to consider, okay, how am I going to support the church this year? A story just about our own personal family. Every year we sit down in January and we look at our monthly budget. Uh, this is kind of our practice. Elizabeth and I have done this ever since we've been married. And, and each year we have to consider each one of our budget categories and how we're going to designate our, our funds for this year. And as we looked at our, our giving for this coming year, we've decided to increase our giving to this church, to the general fund of this church, by 7.7%. That was the number that worked for us uh, thinking about the future. We know that this church has a vital ministry in this community, and we want to invest in this church, and we want to invest in its ministry both here and throughout the world. And so we'd ask you to join us in that, uh, to consider your own giving, to consider how God has blessed you, and to consider how you might also support the ministry and mission of American Reformed Church. We are grateful to God for all of your gifts. Friends, as you go out into the world to wake up, to arise, to shine in that place, may you hear these words echoing, kind of like poetry in your ears. The love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Together we say, Amen. Amen.